Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 347. Science Faction, the origin of universities. So it's like Science Faction, a fancy institution of book-learned... Big city liberals. Uh-huh, that is exactly correct. And speaking of the biggest city liberal out here, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is a foghorn leghorn of the legal profession, none other than comedian Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? That's right. I've argued in court that you, you can't be telling me that there's more than four genders. I, know, I grew up a country boy in the South. I know there's only four genders out there. Do not try to tell me differently. Now, let me ask you something, uh, lawyer Damien. I'm confused. Are you what you would call a big city lawyer? I am not, sir, a big city lawyer. <laughs> Wait, what, what are the four genders? Of course, there's male. Uh-huh. Yep. There's female. Yep. And then there's meat and poultry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why you consider yourself a trisexual. <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly like to sample. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm an open-minded man. <laughs> my bedroom is home. I fuck many of meat within my home. See, you with have, my wife yeah. <laughs> you in have, our bedroom. You have like God it. intended. <laughs> and our scientists of the afternoon, none other than Bill. Bill, how you doing? I'm subjectively okay. Technically <laughs> not great. Um, <laughs> is that is that because you are also not a big city lawyer? Is that no, it's actually because I work at a university, uh-huh. and I, I was just in uh, a clean room, which Ooh. we can go into if there's time. I don't need you patronizing to me what a clean room is, but I will listen, with, and I will listen and pretend that I'm not wrong that's, here. That's, uh, you know it. It's where you wash the chickens off before you fuck them. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You don't want to fuck a dirty chicken cloaca. Let me assure you, no, sir. There are actually no chickens allowed in this okay. type of a room. It's a, it's a room where all, as many particles as you can mm-hmm. are removed from the air so that you can do photolithography. Okay. And I was doing some photolithography this morning, and it went not according to plan. So I you feel like that powers. ends in a monster being born. Is that what happened? Like did, when things don't go no. as planned in your work, does all of a sudden is it Godzilla status? No, no. It just means I have to wake up at like five a.m. tomorrow. Oh, I yeah. gotcha. I see you're wake up early, man. You got powers, and it's yeah, yeah. show up grumpy to work. That, my powers are that I am not deterred by setbacks. <laughs> now, is this mistake your fault? A coworker? Uh, Whose it, tires we slashing it's, after it's, this? So it's a new process, and it's just sort of a trial and error method of getting to a solution. And so this was like one of the errors. I wouldn't call it anyone's fault, except for the manufacturer. We, I would blame them. Have you thought that maybe because you failed, inshallah, it was not meant to be done? <laughs> so perhaps you try something else. So wait, let me get this straight. You are both a country hick. <laughs> Who has sex with various types of animals, <laughs> but also somebody who's an observant Muslim? <laughs> we welcome Sharia law down here in the South. I don't know what you've heard, big city boy, about the South, but we love us homosexuals, poultry sex, and Muhammad. You know what? No, don't ever let anybody accuse you of creating only two-dimensional characters, because this, <laughs> this is just a whole different ballgame. Uh, blessings be upon him, by the way. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Welcome immigrants freely into our community, <laughs> Mr. Big City Lawyer Man. And if you're an immigrant who wants to be welcomed in the community, come on out and check out Nerd Night this August 6th, the second Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. at 32 North Brewing. This particular month, we have a very interesting show coming up. Again, this is where we have three different local scientists come and present their local research at a brewery like a TED Talk, except the difference is, A, these are real scientists who present real science, B, they're local, and C, you can drink beer while you listen to it, and usually talk to them during the intermission, so it's pretty fun. What was the most undeserving TED Talk you've Oh, there's a lot of them that are total bullshit. Like, a lot of TED Talks are really complete and total bullshit, and... You don't, they don't differentiate between like. There's no wheat from the chaff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of just like spiritualists and quote unquote scientists who are actually like uni- podcast hosts. Yeah, exactly. Those <laughs> assholes. <laughs> so come on out. We have a talk on flying cars. We have a talk on the psychology of like game development. It's a guy who worked on like EverQuest and a lot of different game developments for the past 20 some odd years who talks about influencing them with psychology and how to keep you hooked on those games. And if you got a chance, go ahead and hit subscribe to my Dungeons and Dragons live play podcast, Awful Neutral. We're seven comics playing Dungeons and Dragons 
We recently got Militia Rhodes AG to join the cast. And if you're a nerd, you might have heard of Caleb Cleveland. He's on the cast, too. Real funny show. The goal is to get big enough so that Bobby will be forced to be on it. You will have to be a huge city lawyer for that to happen. I'm going to tell you that right now. Well, uh, I don't have the grades or study acumen to get into big city lawyer school. Or any state that doesn't offer hog law. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's move right on to the origins of universities. So what do we mean by universities? In general, we're talking about a place that teaches and does investigation. So that would be a research university like Bill works at at UCSD, where part of the job of a professor or an instructor is to teach students something. But another part of their job and one of the reasons they bring them in is for that person to go off and do individual novel research. So therefore, it's the dual job of both creating and then disseminating knowledge. So given your criteria, the two charges you have Mm -hmm. as a university, could you argue that if I was a professor in the criminal justice department, my investigating is murder suspects and cold cases after work is trying to find my wife's killer? (laughs) So universities have a long history. Obviously, we get some classical, you know, Greek and, and Roman influence on a lot of these ideas. But when do you guys think the first formal university came about and where do you think it was? Was it tied to Alexander the Great? Was it around his time? No, a little bit later than that. I happened to look this up Uh right beforehand. Okay. Also, the Wikipedia article was saying that, like, university has graduate students, college just has undergrads. That is one definition we make in the U.S. That distinction is not made everywhere. So, in fact, you'll hear people in uh, Britain, they say going to uni, and and that means you're going off to school. It could be a college or a university. It would be really hard to do research without graduate students. So it seems like... To be a university, you would have to have graduate students. Yes. But maybe you could also... But that doesn't necessarily mean that you are a university because you have graduate right. students, because right. you could also have master's programs in which you sure. have graduate students who are not, not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where, Bill, where... Anyways, you... I think it is in uh, Bologna, Italy, yeah. in like Bologna. 88. Yes. Bologna. I don't have an Italian so, accent. So that, that is the first official European university. However, some people will claim that this tradition actually originated a little bit earlier in the Muslim world in right. Morocco at, and I'm going to butcher this name, Fez Hat Al- University. <laughs> it was actually in Fez, right? It was, it was in Fez. <laughs> it was al Khwarizm University in Morocco in 859. So this was, uh, it arose out of the religious tradition, but it also yeah. taught non-religious teachings as well. So right. the medicine and, and science and law. Yeah, and a, a lot of the first uh, chemical breakthroughs were from the Islamic community yes. like way back then. Absolutely. And and a lot of the mathematical breakthroughs right. were still that using too, Arabic yeah. numerals. Geometry, stuff, right? yeah. Uh, no, it was Genghis Khan that ruined that yes, hot yes. streak, wasn't he it? He did, actually. He sacked Baghdad and ended up uh, damaging Baghdad so bad, ruining the library of Baghdad. He killed so many people in Baghdad in the 1200s that the population of Baghdad did not get back to the point it was when Genghis Khan reached there until 1948. Wow. You yes, could... he demolished them. You could also blame human greed and purposeful misinterpretations of the good prophet Muhammad, my <laughs> lord and savior. <laughs> this is a really interesting character. <laughs> So, yeah, indeed, as Bill mentioned, the first formal universities in Europe do come out of a religious tradition, too. Obviously, at this point, it's what they would call Christianity. We would now refer to as Roman Catholicism because it's before this, the Protestant split. But it comes from the Christian tradition of monastic schools where you're, you have priests and nuns and they're teaching people. And, you know, sometimes these are centered on law. A big deal was Roman law. Because that essentially governed what was going on even in these later times. It was law that whistled at women as they walked by. That's right. <laughs> It was law that had a lot of chest hair exposed. Uh (laughs) It was law that had huge gold chains. (laughs) So Bologna was... Greasy fucking law. (laughs) Bologna was 1088 AD, and then soon followed by the University of Paris in 1150 and the University of Oxford, 1164. So Oxford, which, you know, we all know is a very prestigious uh, British university, has a very distant past. In fact, you learn things about, like, the Oxford riots where groups of the students got into a huge melee with townspeople. And, like, I don't know, I think, like, 40 people got killed at one point. A bunch of Oxford dandies were slaughtered that right. day by blacksmith and working men. I just like to think of it as, like, the first fraternity fight, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so these, of course, came out of that you know, ancient Greek tradition, along with the mixture of the the Christian religious upbringings. And what really spurred them on, because for a while, you really just had a couple of these spread out universities throughout Europe, you know, mainly those big three that we just mentioned, 
what spurred it on is starting in like the 12th century to the 13th century, there was the rediscovery of Aristotle's works, which had, you know, previously through Greek antiquity had left and become assimilated in the Arabic world and kept alive there for a long time. They were retranslated back into Latin at some point starting in the mid 12th century. And that became the basis for most of university education because we started talking about the natural sciences and philosophy and all of this stuff that came literally directly from Aristotle. So it was like somebody had unearthed this secret treasure trove of more than a thousand year old documents that somehow explained the world in ways that these people hadn't thought of in a very long time because they didn't have that, that previous philosophical tradition that had died out in the Hellenistic era, at least in Europe. And so they brought that back and a lot of the early university teaching were centered around their this Aristotelian ideal. And eventually, that's what spread universities around, is the idea of philosophy, open discourse, discussion, all of this stuff that kind of culminated in rereading. I just love the idea that you find a, something that got handed down to you from a different era. And you got to remember, too, we're talking about the early Middle Ages, you know, 1200, 1300, that kind of time, where it's one of those rare times in human history where you look back a thousand years to the advanced civilization that no longer exists, right? Like we look a thousand years ago and it's people shitting in the ground, living in mud huts, and it's not that impressive. This is back when you look a thousand years back and you go, how did they build this stone building? I have no idea how this is done now. The technology is lost forever. It might as well be Valerian steel. We don't know how to make this shit anymore. I'll have you know that many of my current contemporaries shit out back and do not appreciate being talked down to by big city folk for where we choose to defocate. <laughs> and that led to an expanse of these things that the expanse of universities that started teaching everything from medicine to law to what they would call the natural philosophy or what we now call sciences to philosophy philosophy. But uh, in like in 1200 this was before what we would now call science. They didn't yes, totally. really have yes. a concept of science. It was science referred at that to point. as natural philosophy, usually. Right. But the reason that it was referred to like that is they didn't have really the scientific method at that 100%, point. They were yeah. trying to like intuit the na like natural reality and. and like via logic come to truth. It was a lot of it was observing. a lot of observational stuff, but it wasn't experimental. So you would yeah. you would observe right. this is the rate at which plants grow and this plant seems to grow more when it's in sunlight, but you weren't taking a plant and taking it out of sunlight to see it grow, you were just observing the natural world and reporting on your findings. Yeah. Observing the world and reporting on your findings. So observational science is really no different than observational humor. What's the deal with airline food? I'm about to report on this. <laughs> What's the deal with these weird animals and Aristotelian humors, eh? <laughs> so the university system greatly expanded between the 1400s and 1800s. And basically, we just see a multiplication, multiplication from those original three. They got to a few hundred and then like 400 or 500. And it kept expanding until, you know, you get Arizona State University. As I've said before... We in the United States have really perfected this where we have universities that are only for dumb people. We're like, hey, you went to a football school. That is what this is. <laughs> or a party school. Yes. Can't forget about we party We literally school. have colleges that are <laughs> just known as the place where people go to drink and have fun. Yeah. Yeah, but there has to be a program for people who own car dealerships to, yes. to go through. I mean, like, hey, you're not a genius, but you, hey, you learned how to do paperwork yep. for four years and show up to work hungover. Congratulations. Here's the keys to your Kia dealership. Yeah. That's funny, but also a real problem, and I think only part of the problem in the universities. Not enough people going into Ford dealerships. <laughs> yeah. All the, yeah. I see what you're saying, outsourcing. I was thinking that you started the show off with professors that are doing – both research and teaching, dissemination yeah. of, of knowledge. But at this point, in especially science, the forefront of research is so far away from what you would learn yeah. in an undergraduate curriculum that no professor is teaching undergrads what they are researching. Yes, yes. And, and so there's so – you have to be really good at two or three – things at the same time and almost no professors are and that. what ends up happening at research universities is you usually select for the person who's doing the good research because right. that's what gets you and all the not notoriety the teaching. and not the teaching and so a lot of times and i've heard professors say this from research universities it's better sometimes to not go to a research university as an undergrad because they're yeah. oh, selecting for, sure. for teaching ability as opposed to research yeah, ability. Yeah, like a community college. Yeah, or, or a state is, college or yeah. so, you know, something like that that geared toward, not necessarily towards the research end but to teaching undergrads. Right. Or clown college. <laughs> yes. <laughs> honk, honk, honk. <laughs> Uh, you guys couldn't see it, but Bobby's face is covered in pie right now. He's very upset. He's silent. Early on in the university system, they saw a split where, like, southern universities, like those in Bologna, other ones in Italy, would focus on things like 
uh, law and medicine. And then the northern universities, those in, you know, like England and the Nordic countries and stuff, would look at like Phrenology. art. No, no, no. Like arts and theology Scatology. and stuff. Yeah. Alchemy. Well, I mean, I guess Newton was British, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sun steering. Oh. That's actually uh, the, what they called the pedophile back there. You're a sun stare. You stare at my child. <laughs> now, what's interesting is the like philosophies behind universities and how they differ depending on what part of the world you're in and everything like that. One of the basic philosophies that we tend to have throughout the university system is the idea of academic freedom, which at least to some extent we date back all the way to the University of Bologna back to a document that's dated from like 1155, which is the Constitutio Habita. And it guaranteed the right of a traveling scholar to unhindered passage in the interests of education. So it was like a it was like a ghetto card that you got and you could walk wherever you wanted because of this. But the idea was also that if you had these people who were discovering things that were controversial, that they could go out and still preach them and talk about them and teach them without necessarily being prosecuted or persecuted for it. Imagine if you graduated college mm -hmm. and your professor gives you this pass and says, listen, you're allowed to pursue whatever you want as long as you're pursuing knowledge. Take this pass and go with you. And like you pass through a rough part of town and like a couple of guys like say, hey, motherfucker, give us your wallet. No, I'm pursuing knowledge. Yes. <laughs> I picture the medieval version of that way worse yeah. than the contemporary version. Yeah. You're leaving like with, with no hands. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nerd. This nerd over here is trying to learn. Cut his feet off. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is it is interesting, and that is a huge like cornerstone of, mo of the modern academia. You know, the ability to teach things that are controversial and be able to discuss them and bring them up in classes. And there's a positive and a negative to that, right? So, giving professors that freedom has allowed us to be able to take ideas that otherwise would have been squashed because they're socially or maybe even legally like in in a trepidatious place. And it gives them the freedom to discuss that with young minds who have the possibility of either contradicting them or discussing this issue or maybe finding more research that validates or disvalidates this idea. I completely agree. Could you imagine if Alfred Kinsey was like a mayor and right. not a scientist? Like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of sex with everybody. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> It's normal to bang the mayor's underlings in the attic of the mansion, right? <laughs> it's fine. I'm recording it for yeah. science. <laughs> But I've actually been encountering some stuff recently. It actually was a little bit of the impetus for doing The Origin of Universities this week, where I realized that there's kind of a double-sided nature to that academic freedom, which is that professors aren't necessarily obligated to teach factually correct things. In fact, a lot of times they're allowed to teach kind of what they want. When a university hires a professor, especially when it then gives them tenure, they have the right to teach kind of whatever they want. And that's not always a good thing. So, Bill, how many of these pranking professors are there that just like say, "Oh man, I'm gonna like set these students up for failure"? You'd be surprised. <laughs> so, Bill, you and I share an alma mater at uh -huh. uh, the University of California at Berkeley, and there is a very famous cancer researcher there. I think he might he might have been in contention for a Nobel Prize or something. He he's very well respected in terms of his cancer research. He is an advocate and an ardent vocal advocate that HIV does not cause AIDS and AIDS is caused by the gay lifestyle and drugs and partying too much. Wow. This is like yeah. a top level scientist. Sure. He's not a virologist. He's a cancer researcher. So he's not a top level scientist in HIV research. Yeah, yeah. But when you say, I forgot if it's like Nobel laureate, whatever it is, when you say, when you put that before his name right. slash respected Berkeley professor and then HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Yeah. That's kind of a dangerous idea. Right. But this is not him discussing those ideas in a classroom setting or putting on a test, right? He like, does. But that's not his subject. So why would he sure. be teaching that class? Because there is an overlap between certain things like viral cause of cancer, so HPV to yeah, cervical cancer rates. Right. I mean, there's other examples of professors who are highly respected in their field, having opinions about other fields that are totally off base. Yeah. But it's their like, success bias and feedback mechanism from, from all the accolades that gives them a, a reason to, to believe leave their own bullshit. Yeah. And so the the I think the antidote to that is to just only only trust an expert's opinion in their field and not others. So here's the problem that I ran into this week. I have a bunch of students that are coming out from, uh, we'll just say an unnamed university that okay. I am running a field school with. <laughs> you no, know, it's not in Boston. It's just outside of Boston. <laughs> uh, and I am running a, a field school out there along with the professor from this university who I uh, uh, respect and, and like very much. And we were out there and we were 
showing the students some archaeological sites and discussing some stuff with them. And all of a sudden, I don't know how it got onto this topic, but one of them makes a statement, a very unscientific and incredibly assured statement. That thing doesn't look scary at all. It just looks like a giant turkey. No, no, no. It was not the kid from Jurassic Park. (laughs) No, they make a statement about the dangers of GMOs. And I immediately, oh, man. my ears pop up and I go, wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> Let's observe this for a second. <laughs> Let's talk for a second. And she goes, don't even talk to me about it. Talk to, and she lists a professor at this university. And I went, hold on, is this professor teaching you this? And she went, oh yeah. And then she started to list her anti-GMO propaganda. Now this was stuff that, I, this isn't debatable stuff. This isn't opinionated stuff. This is factually incorrect propaganda that has been demonstrably shown to be false, including the idea uh, that- big city lawyers. Yeah. yeah. We all know who writes these things. <laughs> and it was said in a manner that, as I questioned her more, was very clear that she had very little genomic knowledge. And I was starting to get very concerned because every time she would bring something up, it was literally like straight from anti-vaxxer propaganda side. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second. Is this taught to you in a class? And she said, yeah, it it absolutely is. It's taught to me in a class called How to Feed the World. And I I paused and went, wait a second, wait a second. They're teaching you (laughs) anti-GMO propaganda at one of the most prestigious research universities for hundreds of miles in a class called How to Feed the World. <laughs> this is... That's the equivalent of teaching a class on the Holocaust called Maybe Hitler Was Kind of Right. Like, <laughs> it, it blew my mind. And as I begin to question her, all of a sudden a grad student who is also working with this professor starts chiming in. I realize, oh my God, like this is an institutionalized problem. And eventually I end up talking to the professor who I'm co-directing this field school with. And yesterday we ended up having a 90-minute phone call where I discussed this with them and I realized... He's clearly not as far over as those people, but this person who's incredibly brilliant, a absolutely amazing archaeologist, a great human being, a very, very smart person outside of that, he also had been influenced by a lot of these views. And I realized, oh my God, there's an entire department at a major research institution that is literally parroting out soccer mom anti-vaxxer type beliefs on GMOs that are factually incorrect, not up for dispute, factually incorrect. And I was flabbergasted and I was talking to him the professor that I I know and respect on the phone and I was we went through all this we debated back and forth we respect each other enough to do so in a civil manner was his response always yeah but no 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 not at all he's a very intellectually honest person and he had not heard a lot of this before he did not necessarily realize that this was a lot of propaganda and he did not know that this is absolutely counterfactual to the vast body of scientific research that's out there And I was going, well, listen, how does this work? Is this other professor just allowed to teach this stuff? And he's like, yeah, I mean, that's academic freedom. You have the right to teach things. And I said, so you're telling me if you had a human paleontology professor whose human paleontology course was Jesus created us all as we are 6,000 years ago and that's that, that that would be acceptable? And he's like, well, it might be an issue, but theoretically, yeah, they could do that. And maybe they wouldn't be granted tenure, and maybe that would have other issues. But immediately you realize, oh, no, this is a huge problem. Because while I absolutely support academic freedom, and I don't want to take that away, and I'm absolutely not advocating for anybody to lose their job ever, even this professor who I don't agree with, I don't think they should lose their job. I just think we should talk and have an open discussion and dialogue. So I'm 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 not part of the whole cancel culture. But at the same time... I do think there should be some overview because this is a public university. This is funded by our dollars, and this is supposed to be a science-based program. Right. So whistleblow this shit. I well, think shame. Shame all these professors. No, I think discussion, right? So wh- so the, the shame, thing, through mutual I, no, I, I, I hope you pass them out. <laughs> I'm going to open a, an open dialogue and then present the research as it currently exists to this person who maybe, like the professor who I know and love and respect, maybe just similar to him, just is unaware of this. Here's the thing, but, though. But you can, like being unaware is maybe an excuse if you're not teaching in class. Yes. But if you're teaching in class, you need to have done yes. the background research on both sides. That you is, need to know... And I and this person has very good bona fides. There is no reason this person should be ignorant of this, which leads me to think there might be a philosophical bias that they are bringing into it. 
And this person is kind of the, well, I don't want to give away too much, but let's just say plant expert in this particular field, in this department. She so runs they the are weed se- department. Yeah. <laughs> so they are seen as being very respected, right? And so yeah. it comes to a point where you're like, oh my God, this is an institutional problem within the most respected research institution for hundreds of miles. What do we do about this? Because it is, at the same same time, shielded by academic freedom that, yes, I could come into a human paleontology course and talk about Jesus 6,000 years ago. So there is the freedom to say these things, but how do we confront it then from the outside perspective of the public who checks up on the, the science being presented to students at, at public universities? I don't like this thin blue line solution you have that you're, we're going to handle it internally. Don't yeah. you worry. Well, meanwhile, kids' minds are being molested by nutty ideas every day. I say we open up the window and let that be a disinfectant. Let the light shine in. Transparency, Uh, shame. Well, what you don't want to do is create a backfire effect, right, where you start presenting people with facts and then they're going to dig their heels in to present them back to you. you. What you hope is that you can start an open dialogue with somebody and say, Let's talk about what you believe and why, and then let's Uh analyze whether or not that comes from a place of informed science or, in this case, like I can actually show them the propaganda that was put out by Greenpeace that says these things, and that is the source of this information. There is no scientific source, it's propaganda. We see from Greenpeace's internal memos that the reason they put this out, so in in this case we were discussing golden rice, which is rice that's been infused with it a gene that allows... teeth, but you can still see yes. the mark on it. It's not like that, that <laughs> fake gold fool's rice. Yeah, it's not... <laughs> It's not pyrite rice. So golden rice is infused with vitamin A. Basically, all they had to do was do a two-gene transfer where two genes get switched, and it allows this regular rice that everybody's growing anyway in Southeast Asia to suddenly get vitamin A. Why is that such a big deal? Because in that place, in Southeast Asia and Africa, where they eat primarily rice, 500,000 children below the age of five die every single year from vitamin A deficiency. Another 1.2 million children under the age of five get permanent blindness because of vitamin A deficiency. There's a two gene change that we did to standard rice that they're already growing. And by the way, we're not even introducing a new gene. The rice plant already produces vitamin A. It's just only in the leaves and not the rice itself. We switch these two genes and all of a sudden that exact same rice lives in the exact same environment, does the exact same job, except they get vitamin A. We save 500,000 kids a year, another million a year from blindness. And it has been completely railroaded, halted, and stopped from production and distribution by huge interests, including Greenpeace. And their argument isn't that there's anything dangerous with golden rice. They admit there's nothing dangerous. It's a two-gene transfer. There's no different, no difference except for the vitamin A. But they also admit that acceptance of golden rice would allow for worldwide acceptance of GMOs, which they're philosophically against and therefore have spent millions of dollars – getting governments to outlaw them in developing nations, and also putting out this bullshit propaganda to people like this professor who has carried it on to these students. It is an anti-vaxxer movement that is much worse, because guess what? We wouldn't lose 500,000 kids in the United States if anti-vaxxing went big. We might lose a few thousand, and that's bad. This is a half a million kids every single year from an easily solvable crisis that is being denied to them. They are denied their lives and nutritional value because of the philosophical beliefs of rich white people. I agree. It's worse. The vitamin A thing is yes. worse, but it's not comparable with the anti-vaccine because you totally left out how many people wouldn't have autism. Oh, it's we true. Suspended the... Maybe vitamin A causes autism too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, t- actually, you know what? You are right. It does. If you think about it, there is a certain percentage of those 500,000 kids who would have autism, right? And if they die, then they don't. <laughs> the so technically, they are taking out a certain number of cases You're of saving autism. saving all of those yeah. people from, from the pains of having to be alive. Yes. It's hard to diagnose a kid in iron lung with autism, I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so what's interesting is I totally support academic freedom, and it is a crucial thing that has allowed us to defy the church during the Renaissance and defy religious conservatives during our own period of you know evangelical movements in the early 20th century. But it also has its negative sides, and we have to imagine that every time yeah. we do something positive, we have a negative feedback to it. And some of them is going to be a fucking half-crazy Berkeley professor who's yelling about gay lifestyles causing AIDS, and half of it's going to be a bunch of very rich corporate interests like Greenpeace putting out false information that affects not only your average soccer mom looking at a Facebook page, but apparently also an entire department of a major research institution. Before we move on, I want to let you know that you have not sold me on your uh, thin blue line. I don't mm. know, what, what color is the line in academia? 
What? What? I don't know, Bill. What's our uh, line color? It is exactly gold. It's the color 419 the nanometer wavelength yeah. color. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. That's the best, but that's the nerdiest, big shittiest <laughs> look answer I've ever heard. I, I don't buy that because even if they do dig their heels in, those professors, mm-hmm. the university will hate the press. They'll have to fire them anyway. Let them go be Andrew Wakefield it up. Maybe, or maybe they feed off of it. You know, who knows? That's and it. and also, you're not trying to create that backfire effect in either the professors and students. Hopefully, an open dialogue would reveal where the flaws of but logic But they're not going to listen are. to an open dialogue from, like, the public. It's got to be other academics that are respected in the field who call them all their on their bull, bullshit because they know like, maybe or maybe it's just somebody who's been misinformed and when they get informed properly they go oh shit i'm i did not mean to be doing this most people don't want to purposely misinform their students right most professors got into it yeah. to do the right thing now there might be a strong philosophical bias that this particular professor has that's causing them to do that, in which case you are correct. I'm not gonna change their mind. But if it's a mistake, if they're not understanding the issue like the professor I was talking to was making, he was yeah. making the same mistake, then information can change minds. You gave away a secret of academia not that long ago, something that only people who work in academia know, and me because you've told me, mm-hmm. uh, when you said that there are some universities that would feed off that negative attention. Yeah. Now I want everybody to know, yes, there are, just as there's heels in the WWF, yes. E-W-W-F, there yeah. are heels amongst the university. Bobby, would you mind listing some of the great heel universities? Well, the, Cal? Yeah, the big one is Baylor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yale. Yeah. yeah, screw those guys. And, of course, Stanford. Yeah, they're the biggest <laughs> yeah. heel university. The entire Ivy League, I think, yeah. is a heel. <laughs> but very interesting stuff, and I will say this flat out, right? Not only do I support academic freedom and all that other stuff. I think universities have created the life and the world that we currently live in. I mean, they supported the burgeoning renaissance and the enlightenment. The ideas that came about through the technological and industrial revolutions wouldn't have been possible. Universities have been a place for about a thousand years, at least in the European tradition, in which people can gather to be around other smart people, learn things, and progress science. And so many of the elements of our modern world are given to us by those universities, by the research that's done there, by the minds that are formed there, by the education that's given there. Medicine, law, all these things would not be possible without universities. Engineering would not be possible. The modern world would not be possible. Remember, every discovery and invention that is made is done so by people who have been properly informed and properly trained. And without these type of universities, there'd be very few of those. Without universities, there would not be livable cities within shitty states in the United States. (laughs) That's absolutely (laughs) true, Austin. Uh, (laughs) It makes the world the way it is. And I think an interesting thought experiment would be to imagine what would happen if as the University of Bologna was forming, the Pope had squashed it down and said, no universities ever again, and imagine the world we would live in right now. And I think it would be very different and for the worse. All right, (laughs) let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, article number one, an update on the American diplomats from the Cuban embassy. Did their brains explode yet? So those of you guys who have been following Science Faction for a while know we've been covering this story since the very start and all the interesting twists and turns it's taken. So let's go back and review real quick. So back in 2016, we had some diplomats and their families at the Cuban embassy, and they reported experiencing difficulty with concentration and memory, dizziness, visual issues, and balance problems. The symptoms were linked to like a sudden, intense, loud noise that they would hear either in the, the hotel room or their homes. It was the residential areas of the places in which they were living. And originally, when it first happened, the State Department came out and said, we have been the victims of a sonic attack. Somebody has used some kind of sonic device. Hedgehog. And, yes. <laughs> Hedgehog technology. And they've done this to us, right? And the next thing is undoubtedly going to be a tails attack, and we are scared <laughs> shitless of that. We're hiding all of our steampunk robots. Well, the hard part about a tails <laughs> attack is it can fly. It's actually better than the sonic <laughs> attack. So it becomes an issue where now all of a sudden we go, oh, my God, are we under attack from a foreign government? But then a bunch of scientists started speaking up, guys who were experts in the acoustical field and stuff, saying this doesn't make any sense. I mean, we we have sonic weapons, but the whole point of sonic weapons is they make really loud noises. So you can't get close to them because it's too loud and you have to cover your ears. Yeah. There's not a thing where you just hear a weird noise and it, like, 
damages right. your brain. That right. doesn't seem to make any yeah. sense. We went over this, I think, when I was on that like an episode like two years ago. Yeah, you got to think of a causal mechanism. How can sound impact your brain? Well, you interpret sound through your ears. So can you... it would it would hurt your eardrum before yes. any brain damage occurred? And none of them sh- said that they had eardrum exactly. Issues. And nor did they did follow up medical stu- uh, things show any issue with and your the, ears. And the the higher frequencies, which might be able to affect your brain without influencing your uh, eardrum wouldn't be able to penetrate your skull. Yeah. You guys are saying sound can't uh, move your brain. I think you never heard of Metallica <laughs> circa 1983, bro. I was at the Meadowlands. Maybe they were maybe they were brainwashing people with Cuban music. So what the scientific community came out... <laughs> Super high, f- high frequency. <laughs> Tito Fuente is, is hitting a bongo at such a high frequency. <laughs> well, the scientific community started talking to these people, and they realized that the noise that they were describing as this weird noise actually sounded a lot like the cicada that was native to Cuba. And they're like, maybe you just heard this bug, and maybe what happened, and this is perfectly logical, it doesn't make you an idiot, it, t- it says nothing about you, this is a natural human phenomenon... Maybe somebody was it hearing. Sounds like something you'd say to an idiot. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Maybe somebody was hearing these noises and these uh, very foreign noises, right? If you've never heard a cicada before, it sounds really weird. So maybe you've never heard this particular noise before. You hear it. You happen to be within a range of natural health fluctuation where you're feeling shitty. Maybe you have a cold coming on. Maybe you have something else going on. Your body is exhausted. You're dehydrated. Something. Yeah. You feel shitty. You hear the noise. You associate the two. Yep. Then, then you then start it's a telling no, your, nocebo effect. Right. And then you start telling your colleagues, "Hey, have you heard this weird noise? It makes me feel weird." And they're like, "You know what? I did hear that noise recently." And then you start getting the 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 placebo or nocebo effect, where you essentially go, "Yeah, I felt weird too." And then it spreads as basically a mass hysteria or psychosomatic illness that spreads throughout the population. So that's what the scientists yeah. were proposing. That made sense. What like a year ago, and yes. I thought it was a closed case. I thought so too. We then seem to have similar incident happen at an embassy in China. Let us replicate the same uh, operation as uh, c- Cuban cicada as in China. We will. T- <laughs> it was a. It was hypothesized right. that it was a Russian attack. So, yeah, so, uh, okay. So I thought yes. maybe you were trying to do a Chinese accent. Yeah, it, it would have been awful. the exact same accent either <laughs> way. It always I, goes Russian. I am from Beijing. What do you not understand? It is fluent Mandarin. That's actually his Alabama accent. <laughs> I am not a big city lawyer. <laughs> So the idea then became extrapolated. The State Department's still saying we're under attack, and you still have the scientists saying, actually, what we think happened is these people got tipped off by what happened with the Cuban people, and now they're expanding this psychosomatic illness across overseas. So the debate went back and forth. When one paper came out and said, we found these problems in these people, it looks like there might be an issue, another paper came back and said, actually, these problems you're noting— are part of the natural variation of human beings, and they don't seem to be associated whatsoever with the issues that we're causing. So again, science going back and forth, politics going back and forth, and then we get this week's paper. So this week looked back at the MRIs of the brains of these 40 individuals and compared them with scans of healthy people. What they found in those who had reported these symptoms was reduced white matter volume along with a pattern of differences in measures of water diffusion in the tissue. They revealed lower connectivity in the visuospatial and auditory subnetworks, most specifically in tissue volume, water diffusion, and connectivity within the cerebellum, a part of the brain that's responsible for performing voluntary tasks such as walking and writing, and which would theoretically, if affected, account for the symptoms of loss of balance, dizziness, and all that kind of stuff. That is the part of the brain that would have that. Now, here's the deal. Do we know this is for sure a thing yet. No. We don't know for sure that these particular 40 individuals have had something affecting them. We haven't had a large enough sample group with a large enough control group. We also haven't had enough people redo these studies independently to confirm this. But if they do and they find that this is the case, we are then left with a question. What caused this, right? Is it some kind of sound weapon? Is it some kind of electrical field? Is it a virus or a chemical agent that could have been given to these people that it happened? It's certainly not Russian cicadas. Right. <clears throat> is it maybe all correlational? Maybe there is a different causal factor. Maybe the brain condition isn't necessarily causing uh, the symptoms, and the symptoms aren't causing the brain condition. If you maybe... become a politician, your brain just gets shaped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So like it didn't affect any of the Marines guarding the compound or anything. They just kind of like right. when, when they found out it was bullshit, like, fuck, how much more do these people get paid than me? Yeah. <laughs> Other fuckers. And there's not really anything we can compare it to because it doesn't look like CTE. It doesn't look like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So it's not something that's a condition that we're used to seeing. And we can say, no, it's just that these people have X, X and Y. 
We need to figure out what it is, if it's a real thing. If it is a real thing, what are the causal mechanisms? Because how would you influence somebody's brain like that? So let's throw out some theoretical ideas. Can, can I ask, like, how severe are the symptoms? Like, was it just when they noticed the noise that they had the symptoms? Or have they been experiencing this since the attack? They or, noticed, you know, quote-unquote attack. They noticed the noise, which they believed to be an attack. They noticed the symptoms, and then the symptoms persisted after they were left the area. And is it debilitating, or is it just like, some sometimes se- I'm dizzy? Some seem to claim that it is fairly debilitating. Okay. Is it euphoric? Like, is it kind of like, it's debilitating, no. but like, I can't drive, but uh, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> Take me some of these cicadas home with me. Okay. You lick so, toad. Plausible scenarios. Yeah, so let's think about what can affect the brain that way. There might be some kind of concentrated magnetic field that would have some kind of effect on the brain. However, for me, it's hard to believe that we wouldn't have previously discovered that given the range of magnetic fields we subject human brains to. You know, there are people sitting next to a power generator at the Hoover Dam whose magnetic field is very powerful, right? There are people within nuclear reactors. There are people in places where we have power substations with huge amounts of electricity going through. So what is the electromagnetic field that's affecting these people but not anybody else? And wouldn't that register on things? Wouldn't the the diplomat's laptop stop working if there was an intense magnetic field around? Wouldn't we see other things? It could be like a very specific frequency that we don't use that has a resonance for some cell in the brain. Okay. Uh, but but it'd have to go through the skull, right? Right. It would ha- yeah. So that's an issue. Like you'd have to vibrate the skull with that. No, amount. no. I'm talking about like if you if you're talking about like magnetic or electric okay. fields, not acoustic fields. Sure. That, that doesn't make sense to yeah. me. Yeah. But okay. So a magnetic field that's very specific and intense, but doesn't affect other things, right? Doesn't stop your watch and, or and like really doesn't have that much of an effect. Like why would they go through all the trouble? Yeah. To like develop this thing and then target it on 40 people who like are mildly inconvenienced. Right. I don't see the benefit. Well, some seem to say that they might, you know, that they're forever changed. So maybe it really is a big deal to them. But also, why would you target diplomats and their families in a Cuban embassy? That seems like a weird target. There's no upside for Cuba and China. Yeah, you seem like you would go for like a spy or something like that. But it's it's that that in and of itself is a little bit weird. What? Let's talk about other possible effects. Viral agents. Mm -hmm. You could have a viral agent that then causes brain damage. We see that all the time. Yeah, practically what uh, meningitis is and a bunch of other stuff, right? So. That can absolutely be the case. However, these people have all been scanned, plenty of blood biopsies, and we haven't noticed a single viral or bacterial agent within their systems. Not to say it couldn't be there, an unrecognized one that we haven't picked out, but if you are also a science geek, you will know the advanced uh, microbio stuff is done here. Arguably, there's some stuff going on in China, but it's very unlikely that another country other than the U.S. would be so far ahead of us that there'd be something we'd never even been a- be able to pick out. You know? Well, what if so? What if they're just in a location where that thing happens to have developed via evolution? Sure, but then and we'd it find develop- it in their system, right? Like we would actually. Fi- the, the The whole point of this is because we have really good quantity blood samples of these people and we can't find anything, it has to be undetectable to us somehow. So yeah. it would have to be something undetectable. And by the way, it has to be something that doesn't apparently affect other people who are in the same place too, right? If you want my expert non-big city opinion, mm-hmm. perhaps, if I'm just looking at what could cause these symptoms and who would be motivated to attack American diplomats and their families. And I'm picturing Professor X wearing a Che Guevara shirt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Cuban Professor X. So he's using like a Cuban a cere- fedora. Yeah, he's using a key- Cuban cerebro, which is made out of car- Chevy parts yeah. from the 1950s, <laughs> <laughs> and he's using that to try and uh, go after the, the mental health of other people. See, si. yes, <laughs> maybe there's some kind of vibration that you could cause where if you were, and this is very highly theoretical, but let's say you are vibrating somebody like by, by vibrating the building <laughs> that they're in or something. In incredibly small fashion, like incredibly quick, small movements, so it's essentially indiscernible, but that is causing like almost micro CTE as their brain bounces around inside of their skull. Like you give a, a you give them adult shaken baby syndrome. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something like that. Uh, like they sat down in a massage chair. Yeah, they exactly. You tell that it yeah, was yeah. like super high. That's why the sharper image went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> They're causing too many mental problems. Oh, man. <laughs>
maybe it could be a situation whereby you are affecting the brain by affecting a different part of the body. We've talked before about gut microbiome and how right. the gut microbiome can affect a yeah. lot of brain activity. Have they sequenced the DNA of these people to see if there was like... That's an interesting question. No, I don't believe they have. Okay. Like to see if they have a, they share a unique genetic susceptibility. What are the yeah. chances though that like Very 40 small. random people would have that? Yeah. I guess some of them are family, so maybe not. Maybe it's not completely independent variables. But then also in China, different yeah, yeah. set of people. Exactly. <laughs> it affected the diplomats and their families, but not the Marines, maybe it was affected by a high school diploma. Yeah, that's you have to have that thing <laughs> like to get it done. If you have a high school diploma, bam. It's, it's an interesting problem that keeps unfolding. It's similar to the EM drive, which we're going to cover next week, uh, that we've talked about how it goes back and forth. It's a real thing. It's not a real thing. It's a real thing. It's not a real thing. Science doesn't have an answer for this yet. And quite frankly, the reported back and forth publishing makes it seem like we might be far away from an answer. But if this turns out to be something that is real... The one thing we know is it's something we've never seen before. We don't have any explanation for it. There's nobody in the field that's going, well, yeah, I'm an acoustics engineer who works on weaponry, and while I haven't seen it yet, this looks like the effects we would see from this yeah. type of device. Everybody's saying in the science field, we have no explanation not only for how this happened, but how it could happen. We have no possible causal mechanism, and thereby it seems like science fiction or a psychosomatic illness. But maybe it's real, and if it is... It's something we've never seen before. When you say acoustic engineer, I picture like a guy with long hair, like kind uh -huh. of a torn up Metallica shirt. He's sending at a soundboard at like an undercover facility, you know, watching the Cuban embassy. And he just cranks up this meter. Like he cranks down all like the mid-range, low-range meters and just cranks up the sucks. <laughs> what was all right, we'll get real quick into the second story because we're basically almost out of time anyway. But I wanted to mention this. Very interesting new paper came out on how to make solar fuel without solar cells. So uh, it's leafs. Yeah. <laughs> so what? Yeah, it's actually kind of the truth. So what do we mean by solar fuel? So instead of a solar cell, well, leaves. Sorry. Yeah. Leaves. Instead of <laughs> leaves would be a Nissan product. Yeah. Uh, instead of a solar cell, like a photovoltaic cell, which we use currently, where electricity is coming in, it's hitting a silicon chip, it's an exciting electron to move around, so it's creating an electrical current. That's what we use as solar, solar photovoltaics, or we have solar hot water too where we heat up water in solar cells, and we have concentrated focal solar energy. We, you'll see the big plant when you drive out to Vegas. It basically is a bunch of mirrors that focus the sun's energy into a, a concentrated area of liquid salt that then heats up and powers generators. That's generally how we make energy from the sun. But this new process, and the process itself isn't new, but the efficiency of this process is, produces a chemical called butanol, which basically is a next generation biofuel. You can use it to run in your car like you would with gasoline. And we're doing it not with solar cells, but with biology using a specially engineered cyanobacteria that goes through photosynthesis. And instead of its normal process, it actually puts out this butanol at the end. The thing that's really cool about this is if you had a big vat of this sitting out in the sun, you're essentially taking in carbon dioxide and making fuel, which makes this a carbon neutral fuel because the only carbon it's putting out is the carbon it already took out of the atmosphere. So this is really interesting for a few reasons. One is obviously now we can use the sun to capture and produce this energy. But two is it's completely carbon neutral energy source. It's almost a battery for the sun that we don't have to then put more CO2 in the atmosphere. And you might say, but yeah, why don't we go with solar photovoltaic or any of this other stuff? Well, the only cars that can currently run on solar photovoltaic are electric cars. And the vast majority of cars on Earth are not electric cars, and they won't be for a very long time. So what are we going to do with all the cars that are already out there? People aren't going to just start, stop driving them. But if we can come up with a fuel that's carbon neutral, and quite frankly, one that you can grow in your backyard. If somebody gave you a big vat of these cyanobacteria, theoretically, you could have a little station in your backyard and grow this just the same way we do uh, rooftop solar. And this stuff can be put in, like, your existing gasoline car? Yes. Yeah, so right now, I think you might have to go through a purification process, but it's fairly oh. low energy intensive. Yeah. And okay. then it becomes, and then, um, you know, whether or not you have an, a motor that runs on, you know, the biofuels and stuff, I think you'd have to check whether or not your injectors are going to get eaten up. But pretty much, yeah. yes, you okay. can. Could I roll coal with this new fuel? No, no, you cannot roll coal. You cannot roll coal, oddly diverse southern guy. <laughs> As you said, I'm not a two-dimensional character. He's, and, he's rolling coal in a souped-up Prius. Yeah, well, <laughs> I always love these things where the idea is that in the future you won't be going to a gas station. You're just going to have a pump in your backyard, and you're going to make your own electricity because you have solar panels in your backyard, and you have your own water well and stuff, and we all kind of become a little bit more independent of the entire grid system itself. So I always love that. 
But it also gives us this kind of stopgap in between just straight electrical production, which isn't going to take the needs of all of the gasoline power plants and all of the mm. gasoline cars that we have out on the, yeah. in the world. It's also probably n like a sustainable net waste to right. like get rid of all the cars we already have in favor of new cars that yes. happen to be electric. Yeah, and think about it from the perspective of people who have different political leanings. A lot of those people will see like electric cars and stuff as a political statement that they don't want to make. Mm. But you know what they see free fuel as? A yeah. great idea, right. you know? Yep. And so if they're able to make their own fuel in their backyard, you can get people who politically, for political, silly political reasons, might not be into sustainable energy. You can get them into that idea. Yeah. For the same reason that we like this idea, I'm imagining that, you know, uh, alternatives that require big companies to make a lot of money are yeah. going to hate this. P possibly, yeah, but maybe they'll get in on it too. I mean, if it's free fuel for us, it's free fuel for them, right? And they're already selling fuel, so, you know, yeah. it's like the big energy companies. People are like, oh, you're never going to be able to put up solar and wind because, uh, you know, big coal plants and stuff, they won't let you, those energy companies. Those big energy companies are the number one producers of solar and wind power because they realize, oh, shit, we can produce electricity, which, by the way, is our product. We sell electricity, and we don't have to buy fuel? It's free? Awesome. Wind farms are like, I think they on average make like 30 times the profit per yeah. en per fiscal investment for big energy companies as uh -huh. coal and gas. So when you have free fuel, even big companies do like it. So it, it is an interesting thing. It, it kind of coincides with the idea of the hydrogen economy and the fact that we can use electricity to produce hydrogen gas, which also might theoretically be used to, to fuel cars a, a, at some point. Uh, just one more option that I thought was really interesting. Basically, this new paper came out and said, this process, which we already had created, the cyanobacteria that could do this, I think we increased its efficiency by like 20-fold. And so now it's becoming all of a sudden a very viable option for production of fuel. Very, very interesting stuff, and hopefully it'll be, we'll be running our cars on it pretty soon. That would be lovely to hear. I eat up a lot of fuel as I bust people to go vote from my mo local mosque and other various institutions of varying faith. This is such an interesting guy. I, 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 I want to know your backstory. Where did you grow up? I grew Why aren't you a big city lawyer? <laughs> Hookworm as a child, my friend. <laughs> All right. Thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 347, where you learned about the origin of universities, why American diplomats in the Cuban embassy might actually have been attacked with a super secret weapon, and how hopefully we'll all be fueling our gas cars in the future. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 348. Listen here, Mr. Big City Scientist. Have you thought that maybe... What happened to those fancy diplomats was a result of being exposed to socialism? You've been listening to Science Fiction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>